Ahoy hoy, I'm Planner Walk, and today we are going to be interviewing Landon Knoll, someone who has been to Antarctica and just asking him a few questions about what it's like there and a couple of things about the Antarctic Treaty and all that. So, uh, welcome. Well, thank you. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on your time zone and latitude from your friendly secular astronomer. Glad to be here. So... There's a few questions that I do have because one of the things that I have told people is that there's no laws in Antarctica. Am I correct? Well, I mean, it turns out there's, there's no national entity. Antarctica is not a country, um, and that's usually where laws are, are from. There are there is certainly the Antarctic Treaty system that um, a number of countries choose to abide by but there isn't really a legal system down there. I guess the best way to describe it is um, we use the it's nice to be nice um, okay. method of governance. That seems like it could work. Um, so if someone were to murder someone else, what would be the, uh, what would happen then? Most likely the process of a, of a crime would be that the member country uh, that that person is a citizen of would be obliged to, to, to prosecute. Um, okay. And so that's because one of the things that the treaty does not do is just recognize dispute or establish national sovereignty trade claims. So it would be as similar to if you committed a country, you know, a crime outside of your country, um, Gradually, you'd still be able to be prosecuted on your own countries for that. Okay. For that crime. It gets stickier when you talk about things where where the the various countries differ on what is a crime. Okay. So, yeah, but... for example, drug laws are different from country to country, and and so um, what is there? There isn't a sort of a. a, a a classical country, right? You don't have to have your passport stamped to go into Antarctica or about out of Antarctica. It's, it's, if you will, it's, it's an international zone, if you will. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. So, and my next question is about the treaty because I've heard a lot of people. Well, in the treaty, it says that you can't go into certain certain areas, like if it's well. Yeah. So if you wanted to go into an area where there's a lot of uh, penguins, uh, just say, then from what I can tell, you have to have you'd have to have some sort of special permit to do that. Or yeah. Well, as I say, you know, the the purpose of the Antarctic Treaty System or ATS is really is to set aside um, Antarctica for the for the purpose of as a scientific preserve and for the purpose of you know, or you say, as, as I said, it's the, the scientific and cultural enrichment of the planet. Um, and it, it you know, does a number of other, other things. But one of the things that, that countries have decided to do is that there are certain areas that are much more sensitive than others. For example, there is a clean air sector um, uh, that, that goes down towards the poles and edge where people are doing atmospheric studies, studying the composition of the atmosphere, and it has some of the purest air on the planet. And so one of the things they try to do is to minimize any intrusion, particularly pollution, generating intrusion into that sector. Um, so it's, you know, it's a wedge of, of, of stuff. So even when you're at the South Pole, there's an area where they say, hey, you know, don't go in that, don't go over there because we've got our um, air detectors that are, and, and that, that you breathing would help, you know, contaminate or, or, or mess up the, the readings. So there's little spots like that. Um, also, penguin rookeries, being on the penguins, I'm told, um, have, can be sensitive to being disturbed. And so there is the, you know, don't, it's nice not to, to, to abuse the penguins and don't mess with them and don't, you know, and so forth. So, so particularly, you know, the penguins and, and any sort of you know life forms that are um, there are on the are on the coastal edge, right? And penguins are, are aquatic birds that that 
that go in the ocean and and there are the food sources in the ocean and also if yes, there's you know plants on the antarctic peninsula the very sort of northern part of antarctica those again are quite sensitive to um being being disturbed so they try to minimize um just like it's kind of nature preserve minimize uh impact on those those more sensitive areas okay not that you can't go but they, they try to minimize that so similar thing in when you're at the south pole there are certainly areas where they try to keep um, people from uh, adding to the pollution. Okay, so so you um, so you can go to these areas. You're just encouraged not to go to those areas. Am I correct? One moment. Okay. <laughs> There was a lot of noise and sirens outside, so I didn't want that. Yeah, sometimes that Sorry. happens. Yeah. So, so yes, in the clean air sector, you know, basically when you're there saying, you know, please don't walk in this area because they have the environmental monitors that um, you would 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 pollute or contaminate. Um, and also, in the case, for example, like when you're in a camp um, that's 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 been established for a period of time, there's going to be some um, ice source that's used for fresh drinking water. And okay. so there'll be a sector where they says, don't walk over there because you're going to drink that stuff, right? When you melt it. Uh, so there's spots like that where essentially, yeah. I mean, yeah, again, there's no law that says you've done something illegally, but you would piss a lot of people off by, by mucking it up. So, yeah. you know, don't be a jerk. <laughs> yeah. And if you, if you did go to these, uh, these places, then I doubt they'd be leading you back to Antarctica anytime soon. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's it's again, you you don't you don't you don't want to mess things up. Um, so again, as I say, in terms of the in terms of the, you know the treaty um, deals a lot with stuff such as you know freedom of scientific ex- uh, investigations. Um, it also did a lot of stuff of prohibiting uh, active military from being present. Pro- prohibits um, nuclear explosions. Prohibits. Mm-hmm disposal of toxic waste prohibits disposal of uh, stuff it it um basic governs essentially from 60 degrees south all the way to the south pole so that's that's sort of the if you look at the zone um we'll look at it on a map um six degrees south is where the where the treaty uh, operates okay so yeah that, that makes a lot of sense there is a um another question that my dad wants to know it's not a serious question it's more of a question of uh just just what you think really so is antarctica actually the top of the world or the bottom of the world well i mean our our southern uh folks uh southern friends there would would say hey you know you draw your maps upside down right (laughs) And, and and they're sort of southern centric um but in that sense, uh, you know, the classical way that we can we, we we picture Earth is and we show a map is usually north is is up, right? Yeah. And in that sense, if you think about it, on the one hand, uh, you might say, well, then south must be must be down, right? They talk about down south, not up south, right? Yep. Uh, and up at the North Pole, not down at the North Pole. I mean, it's sort of how we use how we use language. Okay. I also, um, whenever I go to the geographic South Pole and stand on, we locate it and stand on it. I always also conduct an experiment where I attempt to jump up and see if I can fall off the Earth, and I fail. <laughs> five, right? So far, that's why I'm still here. Right? But but you 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 conduct the experiment anyway because you know why not? And in that sense, you know, am I upside down? Well, from my perspective, when I'm there at the South Pole, I'm right side up, right, and yeah. and, and you're upside down. So it's it's all a matter of perspective. Um, I should fun. also, by the way, mention that the um, disputes of the Antarctic Treaty, if there is stuff, is is handled by the International Court of Justice, and um, it allows for country to have jurisdiction over each other country. So you're asking about what would happen about a crime, or if there's a dispute between countries because it might be illegal here, but it might be different legal there. Um, it's it's handled that way. That being the case. Most of the time, when there's issues or problems, you solve them there. Right? Okay. You don't. It doesn't make sense to go go halfway around the world 
they get some advice. You, you, you and the people around you are responsible for your health and safety and well-being, and you're you're there together. So you you cooperate. And so that that business about it, nice to be nice. Well, um, being nice includes cooperating with other people because you depend upon them, they depend upon you. And that means if you're traveling there and you find that someone is, you know, there's a camp a hundred kilometers away, um, you might go out of your way to go and, and visit them because perhaps you will the one to be in trouble and they'll come and visit you and actually rescue you. It's sort of like if say you check on people and you yeah. and when you and when you meet them, you know, they, they say, Hey, we're low on propane. Um, do you have you know, spare, spare propane tank you can lend us and stuff like that. You 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 try to help people out. Yeah. Uh, one thing that I'm just gonna point out is uh, men Mendel brought sets uh, said sixty degrees. I think he was correcting correcting when you said six degrees. Yeah, six sixty degrees. I, I mean, I don't know. I don't know if, it, if the audio cut out, but six zero yep. um, degrees um, south to the South Pole is what the Antarctic Treaty System covers. Yeah. Um, so another question that I've got is because you measured where the South Pole is, correct? Yes. Uh, how much does it move each year? Well, moving, I mean, sort of first, if you talk about relative to the surface, right? If yep. you talk about the ice surface, um, it moves about 10.2 meters a year. Most of that motion is due to the fact that the ice flowing, right? At the, the, the South Pole is, is, is really not the center of the continent. It's not certainly the highest part of, of the ice dome. Um, and so ice is already flowing downhill at that. At that spot, okay. so um, so the biggest constituency is is motion of the of, of the ice that is so so if you will the surface right is, is there so if you melt all the ice um, then the next thing you would notice would be Antarctica itself as a continent is moving slightly um, and then there's the third there's third effects do with due to acts you know. Uh, um, change in the Earth's axis because again we're talking about the geographic south pole where the you know the thing spins around right that's the the uh, it's the rotational axis yeah. and that that wobbles slightly due to influences of the moon and internal forces in earth and changes the angular momentum due to earthquakes and other things so um first is ice motion second is continental drift third is is polar and axial shifts slightly yeah um and also Mandel brought set also asks, have you have you seen the aurora um actually yes it, it turned out there was a total solar eclipse in 2003 over antarctica and the aurora oh as i certainly seen the the aurora borealis which is the so-called northern lights obviously down south they call it aurora australialis but it's, okay. the, it's the same it's the same effect of high energy particles coming to the atmosphere exciting atoms and causing to, to glow. The thing is about um, uh, Aurora Australialis was that um, we were observing during a total solar eclipse. So for a period of time, the moon completely covered the sun. And there also was a group just a couple of days before that, a coronal mass ejection, a big eruption off the sun's surface. So we got to see some of the auroral activity um, during the summertime, which is uh, it was the first, it was the first um, the 2003 uh, so total solar eclipse is the first total eclipse that was observed in Antarctica. Okay. No, in, 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 in there's the next, the previous ones that have been in, um, <laughs> there was basically <coughs> was in accessible spots, but this was a during a total eclipse. So okay. we managed to see the southern lights in the summer, which is <laughs> yeah. a pretty good trip. Um, and just before we get to uh, you explaining what it's like in Antarctica, I'd I just want to make sure what years did you go down to Antarctica? Was it just one year or has it been? I've been most time. The first time I was there was in 2003 and the last time was in January of this year. So I've been there multiple times. So okay. You get a frequent, frequent visitor card and maybe I think, I think if I, if I get it fully stamped, I can get like 50% off a drink at the health pool station or something, but okay. I have to see, but yes, it's, 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 um, now, I'm not certainly the, the, the most well-traveled within Antarctica. There are other people that do a lot of traveling in, in there. 
I tend to go to very specific spots for purposes. Yeah. Um, but I'm we're we're going back in 2021. There's a there's another total solar eclipse. Um, it's the same lunar sun cycle of 2003, 18 years later. And so there's a total solar eclipse in Jan in in late December 2021. I think it's December 4th. And um, there will be a opportunity for about 80 people to go and see the solar eclipse there. And then we'll have excursions to the South Pole or people want to climb Mount Vincent or go over to the Finland Mercury or other sort of opportunities. Yeah. And I'm just going to say hello to um, Pimp Monk X in the chat. Oh, yes. Pimp Monk, is, he's a, he's a, I, I highly recommend uh, following his channel. He's a cool dude. Uh, check him out. Okay. Um, and, and by the way, I, I should mention, Pimp Monks is probably the first person to have had their name peed into the ice near the South Pole. Okay, I think I remember uh, something about that um, when we first spoke. You said something about it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was a he he had asked for this sort of thing, and, and I sort of foolishly said yes. And then we had the getting down the logistics of what it's like uh, taking a whiz at those low temperatures. Um, it turned out the the the, 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 the previous story is I had a help of about 10, 10 Russians who were celebrating one of their mates turning forty. And there was lots of vodka and lots of, of liquids, and they thought it would be a good idea to go and, and, and pee the name. So the name was taken. We we took we took uh, pictures of it, and then we cleaned up the ice. We didn't leave the pee. You don't you don't. That's the thing is you don't leave your mess behind. Yeah. Right. And so all that pee was then picked up and and put in bags and and processed. So we didn't dirty the place. Should have stored it in bowls. <laughs> <laughs> yes well you say it's it's you know you can actually put it outside uh you know because because it'll stay frozen so so yeah. you're in, in fact that's what that was one of the one of my one of my mistakes i made early on when the early amateur mistakes was you know um in inside your tents you typically have pee bottles uh because getting going outside to go to the bathroom spot is is a much more involved thing of putting on little layers and getting someone up so that they have a you know, they know where you are, and if they're con and and viewing conditions or or viewing conditions are poor, you got to have a tether, and so it takes you, it takes you a while to go to the bathroom. Okay. And and it, and, and that, that that's one of the things that 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 when you come back, that that's kind of nice is that it going to the bathroom isn't like a twenty minute thing, right? It's, it, you can just go, right? Um, and so so when you're in a situation like that you use sometimes in your tent you'll have a pee bottle uh or something where you can kind of put it in temporarily before taking off the waste disposal if 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 you so choose and and it's a lot more convenient that way yeah. um you still have to get some layers on because you just can't like well you don't want to to expose yourself too much let's say no. <laughs> and and so um but 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 urine actually freezes. I mean, and 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 so on your tent, maybe the floor will actually be in contact with ice enough, uh, thin enough that it can actually freeze. And I had a I had a case where um, I had by mistake and left my pee bottle. Um, either it had fallen over or left it on the floor. I forget which. And so when I picked it up to go to the bathroom uh, inside the tent. Um, and the plumbing was, as you, as you say, um, in mid stride, I realized that what I was looking at was that the bottle had turned over and, and the, and the top of it was frozen. Oh, all the feet, right. And, and, and a little bit of the push with my finger said, this isn't going to come through. So I grabbed the next thing cause peeing in the, you know, the tents, you usually share a tents with, with more than one person. Yeah. Um, and so peeing on the floor would not have been a nice thing to do. No. So I grabbed the next thing that was there, uh, which was my bag of, of socks. And I had to basically christen my entire sock um, uh, set. Um, and so what do you do with socks? Well, it, it, the, 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 you got to wash them. But again, water kind of at a premium. So you volunteer at the kitchen to do the washing up. 
right. and of, of the dishes. And that means you have access to some soapy water yep. that you can then say when all the dishes are done, hey, by the way, I've got some socks I want to wash. And you kind of pretend like, hey, you know, I'm just washing my socks. <laughs> okay. It works. <laughs> well, I'll tell you. But now the thing is you got to dry them. Right? <laughs> and, and you hang them outside. You basically get these thick, long boards of, 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 of water. And you know we're talking about thick wool socks type stuff. So mm. so that was a process. I my first I thing was well it's so dry I'll just dream out there and and fill it. But no, they just turned into these large ice ice tubes. And and in and particularly, particularly the sun would the sun would cause the outside to evaporate. But the but it would draw dry the moisture inside. So inside was these ice you know ice things. You had to stick your hand down in grab the inside and invert it uh, and then try to scrape off the ice and, okay yeah. and but after you do all this stuff people have figured out what you've done and you become kind of the the toast of of, of jokes for the while <laughs> i can imagine um anyway uh so we'll move on to what uh what it was like in antarctica what what you did and Well, as I say, so if there's any other things, uh, let's let's go to do the uh, we'll do the share screen. Yep. And then I'll do the Lightroom, and we'll do play. So, can you see this? I can see it. Okay. So this is this is covering the the three expeditions for 2011 to 2014. And we're talking about Antarctica. And here again, you can see the 60 degree line where the Antarctic tree system covers. Um, okay. So the entire continent and, and the sea around it is what's, what's, what's covered there. The, this, this red line is the Antarctic Circle. So that um, in the, you know, at, at, the, at the dead of winter, this says, you know, the perpetual night or yep. the, the, the six month night and so forth. South Pole is actually off on the side. It's not in the middle of the continent. It's kind of off on the side there. Yeah. Um, and sidewise, I mean, if you compare it to Europe and 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 this island, these islands off the coast of Europe, um, you know, it, it's about twenty five hundred kilometers from from edge to center in terms of, of size. So it's a fairly it's a fairly sizable uh, place. Yeah. Um, from space, this is what this this is the spot where you say okay we, we call this antarctica and, and what do we mean by what's antarctica well obviously about three percent of antarctica is above the ice right there's a little bit of mountains along this this area here um so we say rock that's 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 there in the continent um ice so this is part of the ice cap the the the, the western and eastern parts of the ice cap um is is considered part of, of antarctica uh, ice shells that are permanently attached to ice are considered part of Antarctica, but uh, the, the sort of say that the you obviously to define arbitrarily define the coastline as that spot where essentially you run out, you know, it either goes below sea level or you're in a in a spot that's there. When you look at it from space, and this was a uh, spacecraft that went by, I believe this one was the one spacecraft that was doing the slingshot. Going back, uh, going down to, to Mercury, if I recall, um, you you see from space, you see the Antarctic uh, Peninsula. There's the Transantarctic Mountain Range, mm -hmm. and the South Pole is about there. But you have all this ice, um, sea ice, and pack ice around it. That that from a from a boat, you have to sort of of, of grind your way through if you're so unfortunate to get into a boat. Um, it's better to fly over it. So typically people tend to fly from here's tip of South America. Um, uh, here's uh, Australia that come in there or from Africa is usually where they, where they fly into. Um, but anyway, so it's showing you that the, the shape of Antarctica varies uh, in terms of how much ice has been in upon the season. So this obviously is during the summertime. Um, people do ask about penguins. And usually when we're in the interior, we, we go to the interior of Antarctica. Penguins are, are aquatic birds that live in, you know, their food sources in the ocean. And if you get a little ways away from the ocean edge, um, the, the penguins have no food source anymore. 
Um, so the only penguins you will see in Antarctica are ones right at the edge of the coast. We typically see also penguins in the tip of South America. So these are Magellanic penguins. Mm. Um, and our path that we typically take is going down through South America. I live in North America. And so going down through, uh, this is, this is a, a Santiago, Chile, Punta Arenas, Chile, and we fly into a, a ice um, runway at the, at the, at the tip of, of the base of the Antarctic Peninsula and then use internal transportation. Um, usually uh, flying in DC-3s are the preferred uh, aircraft down there, but that's the, usually the path going down to the pole and the path that comes back out, depending on which base and so if you, you stay at. Yeah. Um, and going there is a lot of preparation. So this is, this is, these two pictures are pictures of my equipment, my personal equipment and my clothing that I take to go down there. Before you go on the plane, um, there's an inspection which will come in and make sure you have the right number of gloves and, and hats and uh, your, your clothing is up to par. You don't want to sit there and say, oh, I forgot my hat or I yeah. forgot my gloves. I mean, that can I be do, quite fatal. I do like the don't panic tell that you've got there. Yes, yes. My, my niece gave me that in the, for, my, for my 2003 expedition. This, this, this thing here is this is the pee bottle. This is the famous pee bottle there. Okay. But again, you're, part of this thing is there, there is expedition outfitters in Punta Arenas, Chile, uh, so if you actually went down there and you miss something or, or something's not so far, you can get a, you can get a replacement. Um, and again, this is all very scientific equipment and other things there. So they want to know what is it you're taking down there for the person making sure you're going to be safe when you arrive there, you're able to do that. This stuff in the back is, is part of the meteorite detector stuff. This is all, all this stuff about experiments. There's a satellite phone. So when I called Steve, I was calling him on, on that phone there. Okay. Uh, of, of, so, but you know, you gotta you gotta carry all your stuff down there, um, yep. and of course your outer gear. Um, you typically there's a lot of layers that are that are there. So this is shows um, like on, on your on your upper body you have five layers, and you see the red outer layer there. Underneath this is a down jacket. Underneath that is a is a is a wind uh, stopper. Underneath that is a heavy fleece, and that is a light fleece. Um, and then maybe a skin layer if you optional. Same thing with boots, right? These boots are, are four layers of, of boots of things. They go down to like minus 70. So this is very specific gear that they've developed to, to survive Antarctica. And you're actually quite comfortable, right? It actually okay. works remarkably well. The, the specialty gear that's been developed for, for that um, is a lot better than what they did when Admanson first came to the South Pole. Because it doesn't look in... It doesn't look like it's comfortable, but I could be mistaken. Yeah, I mean, you're sort of penguin each wide. I mean, you're yes, it's not it's not a fashion statement, but it's it's it is it is there. And you know, and like I, like I'm amazed at the, at the boots. I never had cold feet done in Antarctica, even though I'm standing on really cold ice, and so forth, because the the boots are just phenomenal in terms of of how they work. And but again, there's a whole system of that. If you have a, an inner sock and an outer sock, an inner liner, an outer liner, and then a shell. And yeah. when you're going to bed, you've got to pull that out because you don't want your your inner liner and your socks to become, you know, damp due to, to sweating moisture. So you've got to have them, you got to have them be able to dry out. Antarctica is extremely dry. Mm. Um, typically, humidity is around five percent or so. It's it's a desert. Antarctica yeah. is a desert, and and they talk about rainfall in terms of millimeters. Like a place we're at, you know, about eight millimeters a year of of snowfall. Okay. Um, um, so it's very it's 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 a, it's a desert. In fact, it's drier than the Sahara as far as as the amount of moisture that that manages to get there. On the other hand, you know, it's the the stuff that that lands there tends to stick for a while, and so that's how it builds up. Yeah. Um, transportation, uh, we use, uh, the favorite use of here currently is a Lucian 76. It's a Russian, uh, transport plane, um, as, as exceptional for going from the tip of South America, which is cold to very cold and things of Antarctica. So it, 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 it's a, it's got a great cargo space there inside. Um, it's not, it's not like a commercial airliner where they make it all nice and pretty. It's a functional cargo space and all your carry on that you have in here 
is the gear you need in order to be able to step off this plane. When they land in Antarctica, you've got to have your, your gear set up. So you start um, you start off with essentially sort of light light stuff, and as they travel to uh, down towards there, they start dropping the temperature inside the cabin. So that by the oh, time okay. you land, you're 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 acclimated, and so you have to go back and 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 suit on more stuff and more stuff as you get to there. Um, they also give you practice for going to the bathroom, a toilet, and sub freezing layers. So they feed you, and then you got to basically figure out I you know not to get fry spite in in the nether regions. That's that's really important. Yeah, I'll um, mention. But you start to see out the window the beginning of the Antarctic Peninsula, this, this amazing uh, uh, landscape. Um, and then you land on this runway, which is pretty formidable. So, I mean, it's basically an area where they sort of scraped off the ice and you can tell it's not exactly flat. And it means that the plane kind of bounces, right? The other thing is that the airplane itself does not have an ability to, I mean, you can't just put on brakes because the plane would spin out because you're sitting on, on ice, right? Yeah. So, so instead, this airplane slows down by engine pressure. So they, they, they carefully lower and they steer it by engine pressure as the, uh, so, so when you land, you got the forward momentum, you're, if the pilot then is dropping the, the thrust, the forward thrust, and then adjusting it slightly to make sure that the plane is lined up. And then when you go to start putting on the reverse thrusters, that's a spot where you have no steerage at all. And the reverse thrusters give you a little bit of balance, but eventually you you you're 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 bouncing and sliding, and you come to a stop. I mean, there's there's a, there's a crevasse behind me, um, sort of as an incentive to stop uh, in time. Um, I can imagine. But, <laughs> but it's a sort of this is sort of our plane there. So you um, are are you you're you're set up in your nice suit there. You're coming down the line. That you stop on the on the steps to get your boots to cool down so that by the time you're standing on it, because this is ice, I mean, this is just pure ice and you'll yeah. fall on your butt and risk breaking your arm, that sort of thing. So once you get your feet cold, then then you can sort of walk around like a penguin and uh, do the stuff. Um, uh, this is where you also carry your own vehicles down there. So it's one of the vehicles called tracks that we, we carry with these, these really cool, um, um, Items because you're you might be on a, on a like a 20 25 degree ice slope where you've got to stop right you can't yeah. you can't just sort of slide to the bottom so a bit of stuff um, toilets are also very important when things first things you set up because you got to and you're not allowed to make you're not allowed to pee in the snow or or so forth you got to have Mr Hanky processed so um, there's actually is a separate thing for peeing and pooing in and ladies have it you know there's there's two doors so this is the liquids and solids because your solids are squeezed into pellets that that become that you you take with you and the liquids are put into this little candor here where it, where it helps evaporate okay um but but you have to sort of tell people about international signs about you know do you poo here or you pee here you don't want to you want to put the solids into the liquids because you then get to be the person to go and um, fix the problem. Okay. The <laughs> so, um, and, and tense accommodations, you, 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 you know, sleep in tents on the ice. Um, your tents are typically, you know, more than one person. Um, part mm -hmm. of also the business is you don't want to be there alone. You want to be with somebody else. But the other bit is that, that, that you can, you know, warm the other people up inside the tents, are, are, are double lined and inside the tent is exposed to ultraviolet. This, this material is actually transparent to ultraviolet. Uh, you might've heard of the ozone hole. Yeah, I have. Um, well, well the, the, you're in the ozone hole. This is where the ozone hole is. Okay. There, there is, there is almost no frequent holes there operating, no ozone above, above you to speak. And so the ultraviolet light is extraordinarily strong. And that means that, but but we use that ultraviolet light high energy radiation that gets absorbed inside the tent and then re-rated as heat. And the tent okay. is actually a double lined here, and this is reflective to infrared. So so you can have a, you know a difference of about forty five degrees from inside the tent to outside the tent, which is really nice to to have. Yeah. But it, but it does mean that that you are at risk of getting a sunburn in the tent. So you basically have to have 
you know, uh, sunglasses on all the time. Yeah. Um, and you've got to have sunblock SP100 on all the time. And you got to minimize your exposure when you're changing clothes, uh, that sort of thing. So, um, and there's sort of a temporary pee bottle over there. Okay. Um, you got, you know, airlock there. So it's really kind of comfortable tent system. Uh, power is done during the summertime. You just have a box with solar panels on all four sides because the sun is is 360 degrees, you know, um, up up all the time. Um, at the pretty at the South Pole, the sun rises once on the first day of spring, stays up for six months, and then sets and uh, the first day of fall and stays down for six months. So at the South Pole, you literally get one day; it's six months long, and one night. Six mm. months long. Um, so there, but you have these 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 tents here inside. This is this is this is a, at Union Glacier, so we're at about eighty degrees south here. Um, and inside, you actually have a you know, like a propane stove, triple line set, so it actually can be you know around uh, ten degrees inside, and it's relatively relatively comfortable. Um, and and food there is one of the important things for staying warm. Yeah. Um, it is not. It's not like um, you can just bundle up enough and stay warm, right? That that's not going to work. You have to. Um, most places that people experience that where where they're cold, they go from a, a reasonably warm house, bundle up, go to a car, get the car heated, drive to a a, a mall, get out, and 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 basically you're using these, these this clothing to carry this warm bubble with you. Mm. to to warm spots when you're there for weeks at a time you don't have that luxury um, yeah. the, the the heat that you experience comes from your own body that comes from the food that you eat that's that's essentially the food source so you are on a you're on a diet of about um i typically have to go somewhere between 3500 calories to 4000 calories a day to not lose weight and that that food is basically keeping my body is actively keeping itself warm um hmm. and so your your food and particularly high they load you high on carbs and other things and that that energy uh to get the energy is what you use to stay warm and then your clothing merely reduces the rate of heat loss okay um lots of of cool scientific experiments going on there very interesting people down there right this is a guy who is as part of the British Antarctic Survey of 1964, we found a food cache, and he came down there to identify, you know, the sort of the archaeological things from this expedition back in '64. You know, really interesting folks down there, but people from all over the world down there with interesting stories. This yeah. is one of our other vehicles we use to travel around down the interior. This, this comes on the cargo plane, um, and there are. There is traffic, of course. This is one of the things that somebody put up a soft sign out there, just because. And you know, this is our typical Antarctic humor. And, and notice the speed limit is in thirty, but it doesn't show the units, so you can decide, you know, which unit you want for. for thirty that. millimeters per hour. <laughs> 30, 30, 30 furlongs per fortnight, or something. Who knows? Um, yeah, and we also we we typically would like to make a, an igloo down there. Construction is one of the things we do. Um, we usually the, the, there's a usually a Dutch group down there who brings excellent beer. Beer is really good for calorie load, um, and, and they bring a great beer. And they usually want to set up a coffee house. If you've ever been to Amsterdam and understand what a coffee house is, it's usually not about coffee, right? Okay. And so they we basically build them a coffee house. And as I said, you know, there's there's no real laws to say you can't do stuff um so we usually sit up there also we we carry uh, our expedition usually has two doctors to go along with it in an hospital so in case something happens to you again you need to be prepared not that you want to you know you need to use this want to use this stuff but you there's a lot of logistics involved in being prepared and being in a place where you're you know if there's a problem you have to be able to take care of it yeah um Inside, you know, the, the, I, so this, this, we're nearly finished on the, this particular, uh, igloo. You got to, you know, pack in ice there, but this will become their, their coffee house thing where okay. they do hash stuff. Um, but outside is where the, where the real, uh, thing is. And, and Antarctic, um, 
view, views and viewpoints. Um, first of all, there's lots of sharp edges. Yeah. And that's because you, we have this, this area hasn't seen liquid water in about 2 million years. And so the, the rocks that are there, their shape are shaped by the wind and cracked by ice. Another thing is that, that the, the sky is so blue, particularly when there's no clouds in the sky, you get this incredibly blue sky, which means these black shadows in order to be there are filled in with blue because this, this ice is a mirror. And so you're reflecting the blue, the, the intense blue sky near there. So you see Antarctica is, is, is white, blue, and black, right? Sharp edges. Mm. Um, and scale is also another thing. You know, so, so this little spot, I don't know if you can see my, my cursor down there. You see that spot. That's our vehicle down there. Uh, oh, okay. In front of this ice fall. This is about two kilometers across the Drake ice fall. And it would be, this would be a major river in the world if this ice water was, was, was flowing. And the elevation changes from here. It's around um, 2,000 meters to here it's, it's, it's around uh, 4,000 meters. So this is about a 2,000 meter, two kilometer ice fall. That's pretty big. <laughs> um, other thing that comes to scale. So this you're seeing is not a frozen lake. This is the top of the ice shelf. At this, this point, the ice shelf is about a kilometer and a quarter thick, right? So you stand on ice and you're looking down a kilometer quarter into the ice that's sitting on top of the other set of things. But the blue, again, the, the shadows pick up the, the intense blue sky um, remarkably. And, and ice does amazing things, too, as well. If you, you spend time looking down at your feet of what's going on, um, these are some bubbles that came through on that ice fall um, okay. where, 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 where air is being squeezed into the, uh, to the ice. Down here, it's being, the ice is being forced back together, and so the ice bubbles start to come up through the, the surface. But ice does pattern like this is a pattern about the size of the dinner plate whoa um and not too much farther away ice was doing this and i should way was doing like this so here's here's an example of a of the wind it's called the scoop there's my friend down here and and the and the wind has basically pushed the ice back from the mountain here this again a little bit of the ice the mountain that has to be above above the ice set and so you get these you know, wonderful ice walls um, no, this is not the ice walls of the platter to talk about. <laughs> Even though they've used this, they've used this this photo to say, "See, that's the." No, no, it's, you can get over that sort of thing. I was about um, to mention that. <laughs> here's another place. So, actually, for for those ice walls, you tend to want to stay away from those things. We went up to the base of Mount Vincent, the high peak of Antarctica, and um, you know you get these building sized boulders of ice that come off of the ice wall as it you know, sort of crumbles. So you'd want to tend to stay away from it uh, there. But and you see the blue shadow, deep blue shadows. Crevasses are just incredibly deep. Yeah. Um, we we measured, we took a, 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 a football or Americans call it, soccer ball sized uh, ball of ice that we scalped and dropped it down this crevasse and used a laser to shine on it, track it down. And it took 10 and a half seconds before, or excuse me, 12 and a half seconds before the, before the chunk of ice bounced off of the thumb around down, down here. Okay. Um, so, so you can get, you know, crevasses that are kilometer deep or more of, of, of stuff in there. You don't want to fall um, down there. <laughs> yeah. So, so when you talk about when they say don't go over there, it's not because they're being mean, it's because they don't want to fill out the paper when you die. Mm. Um, but there are, some amazing rocks that are above the surface of the of of ice. You know, only about three percent of Antarctica is exposed above the ice. Um, it's frustrating for geologists because it's hard to kind of I get a really good idea about the the most of what Antarctica is like. But we have ideas from the from how the continents um, broke apart as to what might be there. And what's there is an amazing. The colors, some of these rocks and marbles are extraordinary in terms of of what's there and what's available. Um, so the few rocks you can find. And then this this was a very moving thing we, we discovered. This, what you're seeing here, is a fossilized inland sea. This was where um, you see ripples in the sand that were fossilized. And there are tracks going through this spot of, of trilobites. 
Okay. Uh, and so this, given the tribal life tracks and uh, so forth, this puts it around 475 to about 525 million years old um, out here in this spot that once was this, you know, Tahitian style tropical paradise spot. Uh, Just goes to show how much the world's changed. <laughs> yeah. The, the, the sky and the clouds there are really, really amazing for there. The sun, but I think, you know, the sun, the perpetual sun there is in the summertime is, is extraordinary to see. And, and so the time of day really is sort of the sun is, is doing the 360 spin mm. and, you know, um, that's what it looks like. That's, I think that was noon and that was midnight. Um, you know, in, in, in that, that sense, so basically which direction does it, is, is the sun as far as, um, as far as time goes. Um, we went down there for the purpose of looking for meteorites and we developed um, a meteorite detector. They, we used the format of a, of a metal detector because those are pretty ergonomic in terms of how they developed. And we hardened material and battery systems so they can, that can operate at about you know, minus 40 or, or, or more out there. And yeah. so we would scan looking for meteorites underneath the surface of the ice, right? And you'd ping, get a ping, and then dig down and find, oh, it's someone's crampon that left behind, or, or something. But, but we have found, I think, uh, in the Reese expeditions, we found 21 meteorites, I think, so far, down there. This method, so meteorites that are slightly below the surface of of the ice. Um, and there's examples. So there's a one centimeter cube, and and this this wonderful, you know, piece of rock from outer space. There's another guy. Another one. This one, this particular nodule was particularly important um, in that it was determined. You see, you can see that it's got this really iridescent yeah. kind of glow there. It's. It turned out that this nodule had a high amount of iridium and platinum. Okay. And iridium and platinum, the element mix matches the mix of something called the KT bound, or what we used to call the KT boundary layer, where and fossilized, where you see the dinosaur fossils kind of stop and the mammals take off. Um, at that layer are you'll find around the world two fairly rare elements, iridium and platinum. And, and the, the model is that the asteroid that hit the Yucatan Peninsula 65 million years ago was an asteroid that had a high amount of iridium and platinum. And that dust is seen covered or coated sort of the earth when that thing, you know, pulverized, shattered and, and, and vaporized. And this chunk here, it landed sometime in the last 40,000 years. It didn't come from the impactor, but it probably came off a piece off of that. The asteroids are bumping into each other out in space, and these thinner bitters are, are sitting shards flying around. Um, the possibility is that the asteroid that hit the so-called dinosaur killer that hit 65 million years ago was bumped by something that sent it on a collision course into Earth. And okay. this is one of the shards that was basically was from that collision. It kept going around until it was caught hmm. some 40,000, 30, 40,000 40, years ago. So what you're doing there is very, very important, I take it. Yeah, this, these and these, because um, because these meteorites we find are in pristine condition. They're, they're sitting in pure water ice. They haven't been bi contaminated by the Earth's biosphere. Um, and so we get... Uh, just about as good as if you went to the original asteroid and plucked a piece off of it. You're getting pristine bits of outer space. Mm -hmm. Some of these objects are older than the Earth um, that, that have landed on it. But to say, to see something like that and experience, find one of these things to be this visitor from outer space sitting in the ice is, is really a special joy. But we also usually, there we go to the South Pole, um, head off there. Um, in the flights, by the way, the, the, a lot of the a lot of the pilots that operate inside Antarctica are, are women uh, from Canada. A lot of women bush pilots have really high skills developed for for traveling in Antarctica. And so, um, we fly um, the the preferred aircraft is a DC three, and okay. um, it's 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 preferred because the the engines are relatively simple. They can be rebuilt, and uh, down there they can do you know they're they're relatively low maintenance. Um, or the maintenance is easy for, for Antarctica. They're also not pressurized. So, so you don't have the metal fatigue you had of, of a pressurized vehicle there. Um, and they last me. This particular airplane had 92,000 hours uh, flight time on its fuselage. 
so they just last a long time. Um, this is what the South Pole International Airport looks like. Um, okay. When you're flying down there, basically you, you fly until you get to about 90 degrees and that's the top that you land there. Um, these are the, the tents that you stay at and there are these remarkable tents again that have absorbed, let ultraviolet light pass through, get absorbed inside and then and then trap in the infrared heat. And you have this little antechamber here where you can crawl in, zip up and then go into the inside. For, for two people, it works works quite well. Lots of scientific instruments at the South Pole uh, Bay area. So this is like the South Pole Telescope, um, Bicep 2, or now Bicep 3, which is looking for uh, ripples uh, from the uh, from the um, leftover from the Big Bang. Yeah. Um, the, the, the skies here are the best on the planet in terms of, of, of dry, very, very low, uh, again, so you don't have the water vapor, um, high, thin altitude, very, very stable air. Um, and so there are lots of astronomy goes on there. Also, these little flags out here are part of an experiment called Ice Cube. And I, I'll talk about that a little bit. But, but this is the front door to the to the South Pole Station. Um, and usually you, you arrive there and the protocol is you say hi, we're so and so. We are in no. We have no need for assistance. Uh, we have all of our food, medical supply, and service personnel, and we also brought some some gifts for you if you you know should should care to partake it. And they say, hey, come in. And so like we we had a uh, esky or a, or a basically a, a ice chest uh, full of apples and kiwis that were unfrozen, right? Um, someone every 12 hours put in a hand warmer into this chest to keep the chest from freezing. Refrigerators in Antarctica are heaters, right? You can freeze things, just leave it outside. Yeah. Refrigerators, you have to heat them above zero. And so um, we had this ice chest that was insulating with, with the hand warmers to keep the, the, keep the, the kiwis and the, and the apples from freezing. And so that was our gift to, to give to people. And they were like, so that's the front door. To the pole station inside is really nice um fire is a big is a big problem down there um yeah fire safety they take fire safety very 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 seriously you know they say that that the, they have only eight minutes of fire fire suppression fluids that they can put on a fire before they do the abandoned base uh thing. so the, the basically you don't let things get on on fire and in particularly if you're talking about something in the winter time a fire would would, would would really be a life or death situation. So yeah. they keep, I mean, a lot of refrigerants don't work well at those low temperatures. This is by the way, ice cube, again, this neutrino detector, a cubic kilometer of, of neutrinos. Um, they had a bunch of these. This is one of the last of the, of the detectors where uh, when a neutrino, the subatomic particle hits an oxygen atom in the ice, um, the recoil and, and, and the, the atom moves at a at a speed to create what effectively is like a um, optical version of this of a sonic boom and then these things detect that flash and determine the the, the presence of a neutrino okay. lots of data cables from that experiment this is by the hospital here um so that's yeah. the hospital and they they turn this into operating theater in case you might have heard about somebody who's you know they've had had to do operations that's it's done there. Yeah, one of the things spot. that I've heard is apparently the uh, the doctors that go to Antarctica have to get their appendixes removed. Well, they they try to say you know things like having things that are not in a case where you're 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 in need of, of something. So so you usually, for example, have to have a dentist go in and and check at your mouth and say you know your 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 teeth are fine. Um, you know, you want to have stuff where you're, you're not creating a medical problem for them. Hmm. Um, there, um, there is a gift shop called Pole Mart down there run by volunteers. And this, the t-shirt I have on is one of the t-shirts that came right over from there. Okay. Um, they have an amazing library down here. This library is just extraordinary in terms of, of what, what's there, but the, the off, what the authors have done. So the authors they would take a book and they heavily annotate it. So, for example, this Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, uh, Douglas Adams put all kinds of sarcastic comments all through the book. I mean, you know, like every other page has something on there. Jacob Rowling put in lots of doodles 
for various characters and so forth throughout her book, her personal notes on, on that stuff. You know, there's there's uh, Alex, Alex Talia Roots. Um, there's a lot of stuff on Arthur, Arthur C. Clarke, Bradbury, Asimov, um, Shackleton's original diaries down here. Um, lots of really cool books in this in this spot. And and, um, you know, authors have done a lot to try to get their book down there to this library that's Kind of, of course, a globe. Kind of sounds like the book version of um, director's commentary on movies. Yeah, exactly. It's and it, it's a fun stuff to to see down there. Some of those some of those books in there. Mm -hmm. um, this is sort of the Jimmy's where they do both. You know, also they do movies. And there's an Atmos Theater. It's a really nice nice spot. Um, Antarctica is for the scientific and cultural enrichment of the planet and music. And arts are a very important part of what goes on down in, in, in the South Pole Bay. So there's a room that's dedicated to rock music, a room that's dedicated to jazz, and a room dedicated to classical music. And so if you want a bass there pretty overnight, you know, over over winter, I should say, um, having some artistic skill is a is a plus, right? To yeah. be able to contribute. Or be willing, at least willing to learn to learn. So music and arts are are something that that you do down there to uh, you know pass the time mm. um recycling again it is so it's so expensive to get stuff down there um in our case i think it was 85 euros a kilogram to ship stuff okay. down there and, and so when stuff is down there you try to recycle it as much as you can um and so they have a fairly heavy recycling water is another case um you know, when you, we have water in liquid form, you want to keep it in liquid form and keep reusing it. So you will, you know, you'll basically drinking other people's urine and other things like that for, that's just, I mean, because they, they take the water and reprocess it. So the water that's used for showering or toilets is reprocessed and, and, and returned back to the system. Hmm. Um, the, 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 this is the, this pole station is the third uh, station that's actually lasted uh, a reasonably long time. It's it's up on stilts. These these stilts, as as they they they, they burrow on the ice, they jack it up again and put another ring in there to keep it above ice. They can also slide this way on rails too. Okay. But um, the pole station is not near the not act the actual South Pole. Um, there is this thing called the um, called the Cannon Strike Pole. This is where the South Pole was in 1958. And surrounded by the original signers of the of the Antarctic Treaty System, uh, there. But it's a nice photographic spot, mm. and um, that's me. In case you can't tell, um, you know. So you're in a spot where where where. Uh, so it's a nice reflective uh, pole. There it was original when when they first established a permanent site at at the South Pole Station. This was the the pole marker, um, mm. and you get you know nice nice nice. Nice pic, you know, nice photographic pictures. This is where the pole was. I think this this one was in 2013. So this is where the geographic pole was in on 2013. This was in 2012. Every year at midnight, they come out, locate the the South Pole, and put a marker down there. And the people that went over design the marker to so have a contest. And so this design was was the planets, and Pluto is there, but it's on the other side because it's out of the solar plane. Okay. Um, but this gives you an idea about that's where it was. The poll was last year, and that's where it was in 2012, which was 2013. Um, one of the things I also do is then do a bunch of things to locate the poll at the time we're there. Yeah. And, and so use it with differential GPS. You would use a sextant. You use other methods to identify where the actual South Pole is. And so my finger is on the – that's the current spot of rotation. For the Earth, when this photograph was taken, it was measuring the the the, uh, the the drift from where the original pole was. So this spot here is where the um, this was in 2011, where the pole was at the time. So orient yourself. Greenwich Meridian is 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 going up, right at 12 o'clock. Oh, okay. Inertial dateline is at is down at, at six o'clock. So all of the time zones converge to this one spot. And if you look where the shadow is, the shadow tells you that, hey, um, going up this direction is noon, and this shadow shows you the direction of midnight. So it's a different day here than here, um, and all the time zones come to that one 
that one spot. That's pretty interesting. So, so uh, one of the things is, and I, I also figure out where the pole is at the time we arrive, and then line for Greenwich for there. But you come back, you know. There's again, uh, we leave the South Pole, go back through the the, or the mountain range towards there. By the time you've been there for a couple of weeks, you're pretty well acclimatized. So this time it was only like 20 below, and that was enough that you didn't need a hood or jacket. And having hair is really important, right? Yeah. That great insulation stuff. So I bush out when I do my Antarctic thing. Um, but you got to you know you got to leave sometime. So pack up all your gear on a sled. Um, your the Aleutian plane flies into uh, there, and all of a sudden you've been in this place without civilization for so long all of a sudden this big thing comes in it's kind of startling stuff but you go and hug people say goodbye um i've never kissed the ice i usually have kissed my glove and touched it on the ice i'm not that crazy um <laughs> but you got on board you look outside and you say i want to go again yeah that's so that's that's antarctica in a, in yeah, a nutshell that's certainly interesting. Anyway, I'm, we'll move on to uh, some of the questions from people in the audience. So, um, Brian... I hope that was enjoyable for folks. <laughs> yes. Brian asked, how long was the journey? And I believe he was saying it about the journey to Antarctica. So, it's to Antarctica. So, if you think about, um, you know, it takes... It takes you about 17 hours to go from North America down to the tip of South America. The flight from tip of South America to the base of the Antarctic Peninsula is about five hours. And in the DC-3, which is not, not a fast plane, is about eight hours um, plus a, a fuel stop um, for, for that. So you're, you know, because you're going from North America, you're basically going pretty much halfway around the world to get down there. So... Yeah. Um, obviously, the commercial airlines fly much faster, uh, but uh, that's generally the, the time. And uh, he also asks, where can I get the the boots that you're wearing, the ones that... Ailey, um, Antarctic Logistics Enterprises will have has a gear. They usually rent, but I guess you can also buy them as well uh, for for that. So a Ailey is the, uh, the prime... The, the prime uh, contractor they're the ones that are doing all the logistics experts and and have developed the, the systems over the years um, learning from other people's mistakes yeah okay um, there wasn't uh, he also... yeah the striped candy pole is a fun thing but remember <laughs> that that ceremonial pole is where the pole was back in 58 you have to walk about a hundred or half kilometer down the line of poles to get to the current geographic pole but it's it's a fun little photo spot yeah he also wonders brian also wonders what the rate of skin cancer is amongst people that go there versus the rest of the world it is it is higher um they, they've had it and and you it is it, it can be higher um particularly in the early days they weren't so uh uh, uh careful about uh, avoiding you know avoiding problems so people the early explorers people like Shacklin and so forth had lots of, of skin problems as a result of of that nowadays with modern stuff um and a body system you know part of you're doing is you're checking your other you're you're checking your 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 body to make sure he or she does not have anything exposed right um yeah. and uh, you 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 know use lots of sp 100 so in that sense the, the other big thing, of course, is cataracts. You don't, you've got to be sure you've got um, on enough protective gear. So I put on my dark sunglasses when I leave uh, South America and don't take them off until I come back. So you wear dark glasses in, in – um, I wear dark glasses in um, – even when I'm sleeping. Um, and, uh, and and when you go outside, you have goggles over those dark glasses and then a face mask over the goggles. So you do a lot of stuff to try to protect it. But there were a lot of people uh, in earlier years, even up to the 70s, and, and, and that, that weren't really that careful. And so they've had problems with the high UV. Uh, Matt Rocket also asks, how careful did you have to be about the crevasses? 
You have to be particularly for going into unknown areas. You you typically would have a that 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 big tractor tread thing has in front of a ground penetrating radar, and you go slow enough that you hopefully can check to see that crevasses are you know you avoid them, um, or around them or bridge over them. We did have a vehicle where there was kind of a mini crevasse where the the vehicle went up to basically about the, uh, about the depth of the bonnet. I mean, it, it, it basically went into the crevasse up to about the, the, the cabin size. And uh, we had to spend a number of hours getting the vehicle back out because that was sort of our transportation and, hmm. and whatnot. But, you know, so you have to work when you're, you have to be really careful when you're in an area that hasn't been mapped. And even then, you know, mistakes can be made. So um, I... My rule is that the people that are there, the people that really, the ice experts, I, I pay attention that they say, don't go out over there. <laughs> I don't, because they, 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 they usually have a good reason for that. Yeah. Um, and some of those, some of those crevasse stuff, you just, you can just, it, it, it's so subtle where you say, well, they're, oh, I can barely see kind of a discontinuous line in the ice to say yes, because at the top it's bridged over, but if you were to walk on that, you'd, you'd fall through, right? So, hmm. Men... So when you're skiing, cross country skiing, you typically are chained to somebody else. Yeah. Um, so the two of you, and then there's there's at least two teams. So in case you run into problems, not all of you goes in. Yeah. Uh, Mendel Brotsitz asks, why do you need so many gloves? It's the layers. I mean, part of the thing is layering system. You you don't want to get so deep that. Um, you begin to sweat because because when you sweat, then that perspiration moves out from your skin to the freezing line and freezes. And now you got this ice block that transfers lots of heat very very fast. And so people who complain about cold hands are being cold. Often the problem is they have too much clothing on. They have just bundled up so much that they're sweating, and that and that sweating is causing rapid heat loss. And and it's counterintuitive. We got to convince them that, hey, you're overdressed and you need to underdress. But in the case of gloves, you have a thin layer. Um, and you saw when I was touching the ice, I went down to my skin layer. You have a thin layer on your skin to keep you know from your skin from being exposed. And then you have a, so it would be like a normal ski glove around that. And then you have that mitt on top of it. And the nice thing about the mitt is that uh, you can put a hand warmer inside, these chemical hand warmers, um, basically you know, iron that's oxidizing can be quite a, a, a great thing to do because you've got this hand warmer and you're working, let's say you, you pull off your outer gloves so you only have two layers, you're working with some piece of equipment and your hand gets cold, you want to put it back into that mitt and kind of re warm up again. Okay. You don't want to get to a case where your, 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 you know, your, your, your skin is in trouble and you have no way of correcting it past. So, so the bulky stuff will also help that. So, like for example, in that that the, the the bag or the the big outer coat, there are pockets in there where I put like camera batteries, and I'm swapping out camera batteries and using my underarms as heaters because they're actually really great heaters. Okay. And last question before we finish up the stream: Has anyone tried a focal pendulum down at the South Pole? Yes, they did. Um, I, I participated in, in, in a process. Um, there was a circular uh, stairwell on the other side of the, uh, of the Adkins and Scott base where the Foucault pendulum was put in there. It, it had a, I think about, we had about 600 kilogram uh, weight hung on a cable and we, you know, put it inside this circular stairwell where we were isolated from wind. And then, you know, use a kind of thing to electromechanical thing to release it and begin to watch the measurement. And it, and the, and the case of the Foucault pendulum, it moved backwards at a rate of, of 15 degrees per hour. Um, cause okay. you're backwards, meaning that, that from a Northern perspective, when you're quote upside down, you know, you're, 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 you're traveling the reverse yeah. <laughs> direction. Now that Foucault pendulum was about a hundred maybe 120 meters from the south pole but for purposes of the size of the earth where 10,000 meters is to the equator 120 meters is, is practically on the south pole okay um so yeah thank you for coming on i would give you a handshake but 
All right, I have to check on their <laughs> NSA. Um, I let people know that that um, if you go to Travel Quest International, there is a expedition to see the total solar eclipse in 2021. Um, there's a sign up sheet for there. It costs a bit of a fair fair penny, but um, if you want to get on to Antarctica, if you can even go just just to the just just to 80 degrees south where all those you know, mountain pictures are. It's a great place to, to see a solar, total solar eclipse. And if you want to pay the cash to fly to the South Pole, they have a sleepover there at the South Pole, and um, it's worth going. I, I highly recommend it. It's my favorite non-populated continent. Okay. So, yeah, thank you for coming on, and maybe I'll have you on again. I don't know if... Um, if it depend, really depends if I've got anything new to ask you. Um, sure. I, I always, always able for you know astronomy stuff. Like uh, um, later this month, I'm doing a, a talk on uh, Libya. We went to the uh, Sahara Desert for the 2006 eclipse. Um, but again, it's it's uh, Antarctica is an amazing place, and if you have a chance to go there, get on ice, um, do so. So check out Travel Quest International and their 2021 eclipse expedition. Okay. Anywho, uh, I'm just going to uh, end, end up the stream and so leave a like and subscribe if you like that stream. Um, leave a comment if there's someone that you think I could interview. It was very fascinating talking to uh, Landon and so yeah. Uh, I will see you in the next video or stream between you and me. Thank you for watching.